All right, everybody, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon or evening or whatever it is for you. Um, my name is Constantine Ash. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs, University of Central Florida. Uh, and today's talk, uh, we have uh, two panelists, just a slight adjustment from the schedule, joining us uh, to discuss uh, democracy or democratic movement uh, in Belarus against all odds, discussion in the future democratic movement. Uh, and uh, those two panelists are uh, Valery Kowalewski, uh, is a representative of uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, the uh, presidential candidate uh, from the 2020 presidential elections uh, that uh, was uh, now in Lithuania. Uh, she, he is her representative on foreign affairs. Prior to joining her cabinet, he served in the foreign ministry of, of Belarus uh, and worked at the World Bank. Uh, and also joining us is Dr. David Marples, uh, historian, distinguished professor at the University of Alberta, specializes in uh, the history of post-Soviet countries, uh, written a lot of books about Belarus, Ukraine, uh, and Russia. So uh, thank both of you for joining us, virtual applause. Uh, and so I think uh, we should just get started uh, and uh, I'll, I'll ask both of you guys questions. Uh, if there's discussion after the questions, please feel free to have crosstalk as, as you wish. Uh, but I have about six questions to ask you guys. I'll, I'll have questions directed to each of you um, and we'll kind of go back and forth. And uh, then we'll leave some time open for uh, questions and answers. Uh, so my first question uh, is uh, to uh, Dr. Markles first and then uh, uh, Larry can answer uh, as well. Uh, We'll start with sort of a background question on Belarus. So uh, Alexander Lukashenko has been president of Belarus for 27 years. And last year's protests were the most fervent we've seen uh, and the largest we've seen against his rule. Uh, why do you think those protests were so different from the previous rounds of protests? We saw 2017, 2010, 2006, 2004, you can go back all those ways. Uh, and uh, what, what made those different? From, from those rounds of protests, basically. I don't think there's a precise reason, but I think there are a number of related causes that produce the situation. Um, first of all, I would say 27 years is a very long time. Uh, most of the elections in Belarus prior to this one ended in violence. The exception was 2015. And I think this time social media played a significant role in helping the opposition coordinate a campaign against Lukashenko. I also thought that Lukashenko's obvious failure to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in Belarus um, aroused public anger and led to a lot of initiative on a kind of self-help basis where Belarusians decided that they had no option but themselves to deal with this kind of crisis. And I think that was one of the first times when it became really evident that the government was not interested in the welfare of its people, was not prepared to protect them against, against this virus. I think also um, this time you saw at the beginning of the election campaign, a number of candidates who you might say came from the elite of society. Um, that is prior to uh, Ms. Zikhanovskaya's campaign, the original candidates included Victor Babarika, who was head of the Bel Gazprom Bank, and also uh, Valery Sepkala, who was the former ambassador of Belarus to the United States and Mexico. But he was also uh, one of the founders of the high tech park in Belarus. And you also had Svetlana's husband, um, Siahe Zikanovskaya, uh, Zikanovsky, who was a a very popular video blogger with a following in the thousands. And therefore you had candidates who were completely unpredictable. These were not part of the traditional opposition. These were not things that Lukashenko had planned for. And he immediately tried to stop them running. And this led to a unified campaign of these three candidates. And I think this is, this is what managed to allow the opposition to attract such a mass following in Belarus for the first time. I don't think you saw that in the past. And I don't think the government and uh, Lukashenko himself was prepared for this kind of opposition. 
you, David. Uh, Larry, do you have any to add? Uh, yeah, well, thank you. And I completely agree with uh, Dr. Marple's uh, assessment. Uh, uh, I would also add uh, that uh, this protest was driven by the new generation of uh, young people, uh, people that uh, grew up sort of uh, untouched by the politics at all, kind of they were apolitical, uh, but the campaign uh, has brought to them a number of interesting candidates. Uh, so the alternative was so visible and it was so appealing, it was so interesting, kind of uh, people uh, never realized that uh, kind of being sort of uh, accompanied by the old opposition, so to say, traditional opposition, uh, people for some reason lost uh, kind of hope that they would see new faces and suddenly they saw these faces and they, they were appealing, they were interesting. Uh, so during the campaign, during the build-up that was started by Sergei Tsikhanovsky and, and Viktor Babarika, uh, people started to believe that they can see an, an honest and open competition of ideas. And uh, uh, by the time uh, the elections happened, like it was obvious that this is not going to be the case, but people already started to believe that this is possible and they liked the perspective. And, it's, and uh, on August 9, when the elections happened and the falsifications were vast and obvious, uh, people felt that they were deprived of, uh, of this uh, possibility to choose uh, their own future. Uh, I would also point uh, to, uh, to a very interesting um, uh, combination, the Troika. Uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovska uh, as a running candidate uh, uh, the, who was supported by Maria Kalesnikova, the head of uh, Viktor Babarika's uh, campaign, and Veronika Tsepkala, wife of uh, Valeria Tsepkala. That was an amazing contrast to Lukashenko. Three young, beautiful, approachable, res respectful women uh, who, uh, who drew a very kind of stark in contrast uh, with uh, Lukashenko, who's uh, a grumpy old man, who's run out of ideas, uh, who is not approachable, uh, who is disrespectful to people, who, uh, uh, who uses derogative language uh, kind of at will and without any checks. Uh, so that was a very clear contrast and people loved them and people loved them uh, both in the United, both abroad, but also in, in Belarus, you could see the rallies that were growing like mushrooms and that was a very limited uh, time for the campaign uh, for, for these three women, but uh, it was striking, nothing like this happened before in the history of Belarus that uh, an absolutely, an absolutely unknown candidate would, uh, uh, would manage to to pick such speed uh, by, by the voting day. And also what contributed to, to the massive mass protest uh, is the, the crackdown, the brutality on first three days uh, when the police force uh, treated people absolutely inhumanely. Uh, it, it has become obvious uh, since uh, internet uh, came, came back uh, to Belarus. It was uh, shut down already on the voting day. About, about uh, noon, <clears throat> around noon, I was there voting in Minsk, and around noon, uh, the internet was down already. Uh, so in three days uh, of this protest, of these three nights of protest, uh, people could see what was going on, and uh, people were in dismay. And this is what started the first, uh, the first uh, Sunday march on August 16, and uh, this has become a tradition for, for weeks to come. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, for a very detailed answer. Uh, and uh, I kind of want to piggyback from the next question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, events that happened after the election, uh, the protests. Uh, is there, in your opinion, Larry, and uh, David, you can pick up on this, uh, a pathway for democracy in Belarus in the future? And how do you envision sort of a, a democratic transition taking place? And what steps can the opposition take to make that transition happen? Well, obviously that uh, by now the protest is in serious uh, uh, trouble, uh, so to say. Uh, it, it continues, uh, but uh, at the same time it has been reduced deliberately uh, through violence, uh, through repressions, uh, through deliberate action of, uh, of the regime. Uh, so the protest uh, uh, itself is present, but it is it has evolved or rather devolved uh, in different ways. Uh, it is not so visible, and uh, that was one of the ideas of the crackdown uh, to uh, destroy any visuals of the protest because it was so powerful and it was so appealing. 
um, one of the features of this protest was that national symbols came back to the scene and they came back uh, in absolutely organic way. Uh, it was not... Um, it was not propagated, so to say, by national leaders, by the candidates. Uh, that was the call of nation. People wanted to use these symbols. They believed in them. They wanted to use them. But uh, the reaction to that, uh, because of this appeal, because of the strength, uh, the inner strength of these symbols, uh, the, uh, the regime responded with huge crackdown uh, uh, to, to make sure that they're all eliminated. And uh, uh, by now, it is uh, it is literally illegal uh, to to have any combination of white, red, white uh, in Belarus anywhere in clothes, uh, on your windows, in your car, anywhere. So um, the protest has uh, uh, has has changed in its nature, in its scale, in its visibility. But at the same time, what's important is that Belarusians uh, still believe that the change the change is imminent. Maybe not the imminent, uh, but change is very much needed, and they want it, and uh, they have not given up on uh, on the hope uh, that it is possible uh, in the coming uh, in the nearest future. I would say, I would say like this. Uh, so the the steps we need to take. Uh, this is a very broad question. I have to say, uh, and the strategy that we have uh, is to mobilize uh, the, the internal pressure and the external pressure. Uh, internal pressure is, uh, as I said, is, uh, is more difficult to do now uh, since uh, the control of the state uh, over the processes in Belarus is becoming uh, more like totalitarian. Uh, but we have gained quite uh, some space uh, internationally. Uh, we managed to build up the uh, international sort of coalition, um, uh, the policy that is quite consolidated uh, across the democratic nations. Uh, the, the response to, uh, to the events in Belarus was quite consistent and quite principled. Uh, but now uh, our task is to, to maintain uh, the ranks, uh, not, to, not to let the regime manipulate, uh, create any cracks uh, to make sure that uh, the the policies once adopted uh, by the United States, EU, UK, Canada, uh, they remain consistent and, and are implemented fully uh, to reach the objectives of these policies. Thank you, Larry. I'll, I'll have a follow-up question uh, a little bit later on uh, the role of the sanctions, but uh, I wanna give David a chance to respond to the same question about uh, democratic transitions and how, how you would envision that taking place. Yeah, I mean, the, the phrase democratic transitions may not apply precisely now, I think, to Belarus. I think there was a, there may have been a moment in the post-election period, in the first days, maybe even a couple of weeks, when it, it seemed possible that there was going to be a change that Lukashenko might leave the scene, that um, you might see a regime change in a, in a democratic manner. And the opposition has demanded from the very beginning um, that the prequel to change is the release of all political prisoners followed by new elections. And that demand has, has remained in place. And I think most people in Belarus would support that demand today. I mean, even after all the violence and, and repressions that have taken place, uh, that has still remained at the forefront, that you've got thousands of prisoners you have something like 700 political prisoners, um, designated political prisoners in, in the uh, jails and camps of Belarus today. And you have also a, a tre tremendous number of people who've left Belarus and moved abroad temporarily uh, into places like Lithuania and Poland, which have become more or less uh, the repositories of, of the democratic movement in Belarus. Um, so I don't think it's an equal situation. And I think there was a possibility also to perhaps use more violent means to change the situation. But the opposition um, commendably rejected the use of violence in the campaigns against Lukashenko. Lukashenko, from the opposite, uh, imposed violence as the only way uh, to stay in power. And so how, how do you change that situation where a regime is using violence and another factor which I think ought to be mentioned is the security forces generally have stayed loyal to Lukashenko. They're, they have vested interests in the regime, as do some of the officials in the cabinet and the Security Council who fear uh, some kind of uh, legal campaign 
against them if the regime changes. And I think that probably would be the case. So much violence has taken place. There would be a call for justice and lustration and things like that. So that is an awkward situation. There have been talk about changes through changing the constitution. Or, for example, Lukashenko himself wants to call another people's assembly, which is a, a hand-picked body appointed by him um, to, to introduce changes to the constitution. But I think the original constitution of Belarus was perhaps not faultless, but it worked. And it worked until it was changed by two referendums in 1995, 1996, and a further one in 1994, which in fact removed the power of the constitutional court, removed the power of the parliament, invested all powers in the president, changed national symbols and other things. And I think you could go back to the original constitution and it would, it would be a reasonable place to start. Um, but again, it's, it depends on a lot of things, a lot of factors in order to get everything changed. And we've only discussed a few of them. I mean, I think economic factors are absolutely critical now in the future of Belarus, but I'm not going to preempt your future questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you, David. And yeah, I do, I do have a couple of questions that uh, are also uh, follow up on things you've said, but I, I want to jump ahead uh, to uh, something Valeri said. Uh, and talk about uh, the EU and the US that uh, they've routinely sanctioned the Belarusian government over the last few years, but there, there have been more stringent sanctions implemented recently. Um, what effects do you anticipate these sanctions will have? And sort of another question uh, that may be a little bit challenging, could association of the movement with the EU, with the US uh, be detrimental in terms of drawing domestic support? Well, in the first place, speaking about sanctions, uh, we we have to um, recognize that there was an evolution uh, in uh, their development uh, over these 14 months. Um, they started with sort of symbolic gestures, uh, the um, kind of naming and shaming people who were who've been involved in uh, human rights violations. Uh, so the the economic sanctions uh, that could be impactful uh, and, and, and individual sanctions uh, will, would not have any effect. That was quite predictable. Uh, but uh, the EU in particular, they have taken this gradual approach, gradual build up uh, in pressure approach, hoping that uh, it would um, it would give chance and space uh, to to the regime to change its behavior. Uh, and definitely that kind of a, it was a hopeless uh, case uh, with Lukashenko who has endured sanctions before and, and knew how to, how to bypass them or sort of how to treat them. Uh, but first economic sanctions or sort of signs of economic sanctions happened only in December uh, last year. And uh, those were uh, frankly not, not very convincing uh, to, to anyone, especially to the regime. Uh, but EU has continued uh, this this path, and uh, and the United States followed. Uh, the United States resumed its sanctions in June, that were suspended for quite some time, and uh, they were really uh, kind of about business. There were about nine uh, enterprises in, in Belarus, uh, but strangely enough, I mean not strangely enough, but the United States chose not to resume the sanctions when the grounds uh, for, for the resumptions were so obvious. Um, nevertheless, uh, the EU uh, actually invoked sanctions when it was um, when uh, the situation with the seizure of the Ryanair flight happened. Uh, so uh, while the, the context in Belarus was uh, sufficient to introduce the toughest sanctions ever, um, it, it was actually about the interest of the uh, EU citizens affected that um, uh, helped EU be more resolute uh, in, uh, in bringing sanctions uh, against Lukashenko. So um, in August, uh, another round of sanctions followed when the United States president signed a new executive order on the sanctions regime and, uh, the, and they have uh, complemented their sanctions regime uh, with uh, new enterprises essentially synchronizing with the EU. Also important to, important to note that UK and Canada join the sanctions regime. So now we have a more or less synchronized, even though there are some, uh, some gaps, uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a concerted effort. Uh, but at the same time, it is still too early to say uh, that sanctions started working. 
Uh, there are some signs of that, uh, but economic sanctions, sectoral sanctions, they have not uh, they have not had the impact yet, just because uh, the the timeline uh, to enact them uh, is so long. It takes months and months because of uh, different considerations. Uh, but we expect that probably in December, January, and February we will see first serious signs of sanctions uh, uh, being impactful. However, we also have to note that uh, Lukashenko is, uh, and his regime uh, uh, has, has accumulated quite experience uh, in uh, managing sanctions, bypassing sanctions, uh, also with the help of Russians. Uh, this probably can be a different story, but nevertheless, we have to admit also, and we have to be mindful of, uh, of uh, the ability to um, kind of to minimize the effect of sanctions. Uh, if we speak about the association of the democratic forces with the EU and the United States, uh, this has not been a, sort of a deliberate choice uh, to go with the West, so to say. Uh, we were seeking help elsewhere. Uh, there were numerous appeals to Russia uh, to stop supporting Lukashenko. And uh, to, uh, because uh, the association was and the connection uh, was quite clear between the repressions and beating and torture in Belarus and, uh, and the support that Russia provided to, to Lukashenko. So uh, the, these attempts to reach out to Russia, they have been registered from the very beginning. Unfortunately, Russians uh, made their choice. Uh, they cho chose to be with uh, Lukashenko and they stay with him. Um, until now. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, democratic forces, uh, civil society of Belarus, independent media organizations, we have to seek help where it, where it is uh, await, awaiting us and uh, we'll continue going this way. At the same time, we would not, uh, we would not mind uh, talking to, uh, to the Russian Federation about, uh, um, uh, about evolving their own approach to the situation in Belarus and minimizing their negative effects uh, on the events in our country. Thank you, Valeri. And uh, David, same question to you about the effectiveness of sanctions and uh, possible drawbacks. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with what Valeri said. Um, and I think especially the, you know, the fact that the sanctions imposed by the EU were only raised after the hijacking of the Ryanair flight last May. I mean, that was really the catalyst of serious sanctions from the Europeans. And I think we can keep in mind that the Europeans for a number of years now, since around 2008, 2009, involved Belarus in the Eastern Partnership Project, which was derailed in 2010, but is, you know, took off again a few years later. And the EU, you know, opened an office in Minsk. They tried various programs with grassroots society. Didn't put a massive amount of money in, but a, a significant amount of money in. And there was an attempt to form a dialogue with the Belarusian authorities. Again, in the belief that there are people in the government of Belarus who don't do not necessarily agree with the line taken by the by Lukashenko, and that therefore there must be some room for maneuver within the Belarusian elite. Um, and I don't think it's ever really worked. I don't think the dialogue has worked. I don't think the previous dialogue that was started in 1999 worked either. You know, it's been tried before. But it was that incident that, that sparked the real changes. And I think where you have to hit Belarus, if you're really going to have an impact on Belarus, are it's, so my phone chose to ring at that time. It's way back in the back now. Um, and I think the, the the main thing is the resources of Belarus that are being exported. Um, perhaps, for example, potash fertilizer. Um, the potash company, the factory there, is the most is the richest one in Belarus, and it exports its goods mainly through the port in Klaipeda in Lithuania. Um, this port is now off limits to the Belarusians, and so the Russians have therefore said, "Well, you can you can use our ports." But it's a major problem because Belarus is landlocked, it's got no ports, it's got to use some kind of um, outside power in order to export its products. I don't think there's a lot of um, maneuver in terms of, of um, needing the goods. I mean, Belarus doesn't produce goods that the United States needs, for example, for the most part, and, and Canada even less so, right? We don't trade that much with Belarus. But the trading 
goes through other countries, and it's these other countries that are, be, are going to be affected. I mean, the, the Lithuanian railways, for example, have lost something like 30% of their income in recent months uh, because they're no longer transporting the, the potash fertilizers to the ports in, in Klaipeda. I mean, it's a massive uh, income maker for, for that country as well. But the relations between Lithuania um, and Belarus are almost non-existent right now. Um, in terms of whether it, it looks bad, say, for the opposition, if you've got these links with the United States or with the U European Union, I would say, first of all, that the, the, the European Union's presence in Belarus of late has been more or less invisible. Most people don't know about the sanctions. And keep in mind that the media in Belarus has been virtually shut down. Every independent media association of any note is now closed, including uh, Toot BY, um, other opposition newspapers have been shut down, all NGOs are being targeted, and therefore, in terms of sources of news, there's not much for the population except what's coming from Russia, which, um, you know, even the Belarusian programs have, have got Russian announcers at the moment, uh, uh, imported from, from the Russian Federation. So the whole media is, in effect, propagating what Russia wants the public to hear as opposed to a sort of mixed bag of local news and outside information. And I think that's why um, it's very difficult for the West to get a foothold now in, in Belarus. Even, even um, associations like Svoboda, Radio Liberty in Belarus, uh, they've been targeted as well. Their journalists have been arrested and harassed. So how do, how do Belarusians get to know what's coming from the outside, what the outside world thinks of what's happening in Belarus. And that's a difficult thing. And, and I think this is why opinion begins to change sometimes. And perhaps uh, the opposition today in Belarus, uh, perhaps there's still a hard core opposing the regime, maybe 40% maybe according to a recent poll, somewhere around there. But there's also a big group in the middle, um, not in favor of Lukashenko, but not necessarily committed to the opposition cause either. And that I think is the group that has to be convinced if there's going to be democratic change in Belarus. And it's a strata that probably makes up 30 or 40% of the population. Their prime interest is standards of living, what their future is gonna be. And if we do shut down all these companies through sanctions or, or bankrupt them or whatever, What's going to happen to these workers? Who's going to care about them? And what is their future going to be? And it's quite natural, I think, that that should be people's prime concern. Uh, so if I follow up on this a, a little bit, uh, kind of especially on the last point, uh, what would be the impact on the on the population, on workers and such? Like from the very beginning when the crackdown started last fall, um, the, the, the support for sanctions, for strong economic sanctions was overwhelming in Belarus and people wanted them badly. People literally begged uh, the SWIFT uh, to be disconnected from uh, Belarus or vice versa, Belarus disconnected from SWIFT, uh, seeing it as, as an effective immediate kind of sudden death tool uh, to influence the situation in real uh, in Belarus. By now, and these are fairly fresh numbers uh, in a, one of the surveys uh, that we have received, uh, is that the perception of sanctions in Belarus among Belarusians uh, stands, but positive uh, perception is 41%. Negative is uh, 26%. So still kind of one year in, uh, 14 months in, uh, after the, uh, the elections and uh, with a very limited uh, access to information, people still uh, kind of support this approach. What's interesting is the, uh, how many people, uh, the percentage of people who consider responsible the regime for sanctions. 55% of Belarusians think that this is the Lukashenko's regime who is responsible for sanctions and they will consider him responsible for the economic impact. Uh, detrimental impact of the sanctions, if any, at all. And only 11% of Belarusians consider democratic forces to be responsible for sanctions. I'll stop here. Thank you, Valeri. Uh, and I, I wanted to pick up on something David mentioned, because I, I have a kind of a broader question on this that I skipped over, but we can, we can pick it up. Uh, and that, you know, there are those people in the country that support the regime. And uh, as David said, there are people who oppose Lukashenko, but might not be, they're sort of in the middle. They're not maybe super comfortable with the opposition either. What 
steps need to be taken to convince either the sort of in-between people or even the people who are currently supporting Lukashenko? So uh, probably the, the most obvious response uh, is to uh, to reach to people with information about the events uh, so that people are aware about the facts uh, on the ground, not, not only about the human rights abuses, but also about the incompetence of the government uh, in managing problems uh, in uh, in Belarus, and uh, we um, we see for again, 14 months has passed have passed, and uh, Lukashenko has not shown any signs that he is willing to resolve to address the problems uh, that uh, that the society is facing by any means other than violence and repressions. Like this is his favorite tool, and he is not giving up on that. He is not even trying to establish uh, any credible dialogue uh, with the society. Uh, the, the campaign he is running uh, with the referendum and new constitution is something that has never been called for. And people were not asking about the referendum. People were not asking about the new constitution because everybody knows that uh, any constitution written and adopted by Lukashenko will be violated on the day one, uh, as soon as it is adopted. Uh, so uh, he is running the sham campaign and uh, people don't have trust in this. Uh, but people need to have more information about it. People need to have more space to discuss, to exchange opinions about this. Uh, what's, what, what is in our hands, what we're doing uh, is, uh, is to, uh, to make sure that we can visualize the future of uh, new Belarus uh, for the people. Uh, because very often people uh, don't know what is, what, is, what is there ahead of us. We want new elections. We want a legitimate leadership. But we have no idea what it means, like what, what actually new democratic Belarus uh, would mean in practice. And this is what we're working on now uh, to develop the concept of new Belarus, to visualize specific elements of it, what would be the investment climate, what would be the conditions for the economy, uh, how the education would work, what would be the foreign policy approaches uh, in new Belarus, and, and so on and so on. There are so many things to change. There are so many ch things to improve uh, in Belarus. So this is something to convince this uh, middle ground, this uh, middle strata of the Belarusian society, sort of undecided, uh, to excite them about the future, uh, to visualize the future that would be appealing and answering their questions and concerns. Thank you, Valerie. David, same question to you. I don't really have any disagreements with what Valeri just said. I think um, that's pretty well spot on. I think um, perhaps, Belarusians, I mean, in some cases, although Belarus has been dominated by state-run enterprises, which are allowed to, to run at a loss sometimes, I mean, they're heavily subsidized, and there have been no attempts to reform the overall system. There have been examples of Belarusians using their own initiative. I mean, the high-tech park is a, is a prime example. In terms of that industry, the Belarusians are among the top people in Europe. Um, they've also got highly educated workforce. It's a very urbanized society. Most Belarusians are well-traveled. Many of them, I don't know about the majority, but many of those, especially those who travel, um, can speak several languages. I mean, this is, a, this is a workforce that can determine its own future if the conditions are made available for them to do that. Instead of being in this kind of repressed society, where uh, wages are very low and the state decides all parts of the economy, what the economy is going to be. I mean, in a way, it's not moved forward at any point under Lukashenko. There's been no economic reforms. There's been no attempt even of a, of a vision of the future. In any election, there's never been a vision of the future. And I think that's why the last election was so different, because it did seem that Belarusians could actually take things into their own hands and finally begin to move forward uh, from 1994, where they've been stuck for so long. That's not to say that Lukashenko today is the same as Lukashenko in 1994. Um, you know, and I think without being ageist, he's, he's losing his grip. He's made a number of fundamental blunders over the past year and a half that you would not have expected him to make earlier. And ultimately, Lukashenko will not be the president of Belarus. I mean, he's not going to be there forever. And I think uh, we haven't talked about Russia yet, but well, Valeri did briefly, but he's, he's there because Russia keeps him there. 
That's the only reason Lukashenko is in power today is because he's got Russia behind him. And it's kind of ironic because at the beginning of the election campaign, he was arresting uh, Russian mercenaries and accusing Russia of disrupting his election campaign and trying to overthrow him. This now changed completely. And he is totally reliant on Russian loans and he's reliant on Russian military aid. They've had military joint operations in Zapad 2021 just recently. Um, there is a joint military base opening near Hrodna of, of both armies. Russia is the one behind this. And I think that is the fundamental point to make, that you have to deal with that fact. Russia is there. And without being too macabre about it, it's very hard to think of going forward into a future where Russia is not involved in some way, even though this election was about not only electoral change, but cultural change, psychological change, the way of thinking and developing some kind of Belarusian national identity that's separate from the one being perpetuated by Lukashenko, which is always looking back in the past to the war, to the remnants of the Soviet period and the glories of the Soviet period, quote unquote. So I think it, change will come, but it's going to be very difficult. And I think the West has to back Belarus unequivocally for it to have any chance of democratic change, which was the basic question you put. Thank you, David. Uh, and so I wanted to pick up on, we, we've mentioned Russia a few times, both you and Valeri. Uh, I wanna ask a general question starting with Valeri on this. So if Russia is such a strong supporter and it may be propping up the, the government, uh, Lukashenko, how, how would the opposition convince Russia to at least not mind that the opposition came to power? Because, you know, in Armenia, there was regime change. Nikol Pashinyan in Kyrgyzstan, there's been regime changes that Russia more or less allows and doesn't really care about. Um, how do you get to that level? Uh, yeah, well, there's a good example also of Moldova uh, that uh, has, uh, has had just, just had excellent elections that uh, kind of would bring more democracy uh, to this country. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, uh, we have followed the mandate of the street, of the protest, uh, which was quite clear. Uh, the protest is about internal issues. It is about democracy uh, in Belarus. It doesn't have any geopolitical undertones. Uh, it is not uh, anti-Russia or pro-West uh, or pro-NATO or anything like that. Uh, and we have been careful until now uh, and will continue to, uh, to point at this uh, important kind of this is a core element of the protest that uh, it is about uh, people's willingness, people's desire to be uh, to be involved in the politics and to, to have uh, legitimate and credible um, uh, political leadership uh, in the country. And uh, the role of Russia, the place of Russia in uh, sort of foreign policy architecture of Belarus has never been disputed uh, by democratic leaders, by democratic forces. Unfortunately, until now, uh, we have not seen any effects on, uh, on Russia's uh, perception of democratic forces. Essentially, they have been dismissive of democratic forces in general and uh, of uh, uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovska in particular. And uh, uh, to some degree, kind of, uh, I think that maybe to a significant degree, uh, the, the reason of this dismissal uh, is, uh, uh, is a concern of Russian leadership uh, that uh, the Belarusian example can be a little bit too, too popular among Russians themselves. And uh, that can that can uh, <clears throat> excite Russians, and we have seen it, and we saw it actually during the protest, uh, the most uh, active uh, part of the protest campaign in Belarus. That uh, in some Russian cities, we saw the same slogans, we saw the same uh, patterns of protest, and uh, it definitely spooked Russian leadership uh, that something like this can uh, spread across Russia. Uh, I could I could point in some uh, observation that uh, until January. Uh, probably this year, uh, Russian media uh, would provide more space, uh, would provide more opportunities for democratic forces to, to be present, uh, to speak, to express, uh, to explain uh, what's going on in democratic forces in Belarus in particular. And uh, after January, uh, and this is when Navalny came back uh, to Russia, 
uh, essentially they cut out, uh, cut off all the ties, all the opportunities to um, to have uh, uh, the representatives of democratic forces to speak uh, in the media uh, to Russian audience. Uh, so this, um, at the moment, uh, we see a bit of a stalemate uh, in terms of um, uh, accepting uh, the democratic forces movement uh, in Belarus as not, not threatening uh, the inherent Russian interests uh, in Belarus mm -hmm. and around it. Um, but uh, at the same time, we, uh, we, we continue working in different directions. For example, we always welcome Russia's participation in, um, <clears throat> in mediation processes, multilateral efforts to, uh, to, con to discuss and resolve the crisis in Belarus. Uh, we're also uh, we're also cognizant that Russia is incurring certain costs uh, because of Lukashenko. It is becoming more expensive. Uh, Russia uh, is enduring some effects uh, from from the sanctions regime, especially in the oil processing industry. Uh, so this this is something that might create distance uh, between uh, Lukashenko and Putin, and uh, would make Lukashenko a bit more expensive to Russia than uh, they would want to uh, to bear. Um, so we're moving in these directions. Uh, it is it is not completely certain um, how it will unfold, uh, but this is what we have now. Larry, uh, David, same question. Yeah, and I think um, we could add also to those comments um, the legacy of the color revolutions as as far as Putin is concerned. Um, it has this almost paranoia about these kind of revolutions, which he sees as sponsored entirely by the West, which in his view changed the regime in Ukraine in, in 2014 with the departure of Viktor Yanukovych as president. And I think that the big fear in Russia is that the same kind of thing would happen in Belarus. And it's, um, it's a matter of convincing the Russian leadership that there is actually no there was no pro-Western element to the opposition campaign in 2020. I mean, the West really paid no attention at all. Well, it may have paid attention, but it certainly didn't give any help uh, to the opposition. It was a purely homegrown movement. Lukashenko is claiming the same thing today, that this is a Western operation. The West is trying to get rid of him. And in fact, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult thing for, for Putin as well to, to back the opposition against someone who may be an irritant and he may be annoying, but he actually is a known quantity and replace him with someone who is actually not known. I mean, there's a position earlier that, that Babarika uh, was, a, was a Putin, uh, was it, well, sorry, not Putin, but was a, a, a Russian campaigner, you know, that Russia wanted him to take over as president because he had a lot of economic links with Russia. He was reliable and he would keep up the closer relationship with Russia. Uh, that turned out not to be the case because Lukashenko arrested him and Russia didn't, didn't protest. Uh, Valeria mentioned changes coming around January, February. Um, I think maybe even in, a bit earlier in November, Putin made a decision because it seemed to be in November where he, he completely rejected any kind of conversation with, with the opposition and decided to stay with Lukashenko, but I don't think it's um, it's not a complete commitment. I mean, he gave he gave Belarus a, a loan of one point five billion dollars. Uh, Belarus probably asked for ten million. I mean, this is it's a small amount. It's almost like okay for now. This is okay for now. We'll deal with you for now. But I think in a case where there was a national strike in Belarus, um, which would probably lead to, to to more protests if that did happen. And the Belarusian economy suffered a catastrophic decline. I mean, it is having problems right now already. The GDP is, is um, the prognosis is for a negative GDP growth this year, whereas earlier, according to the World Bank, it was for a positive one. But if it were to completely collapse, then that would change everything because the not only would the population um, turn more against against the, the re regime that's in power, but also it would likely convince Putin that it's no longer viable to keep propping up Lukashenko and that it's time to look around and see what alternatives there are. The other aspect I'd like to mention, there was an article last week, and I forget where it was now, but there was a fear in Russia 
of the what it was called the Belarusization of Belarus, that is the development of the culture and language of Belarus, which with Russia's integration programs is not very popular. And the alternative question is, would Belarus be integrated completely into Russia? And I think it's quite clear that most Belarusians are pro-Russian, but they don't want to be integrated within Russia. They're happy with independence and they'd like to develop that independent state further. So Putin has got to take all these things into consideration. And it's not just a question of annexing some territory like he did in Ukraine. And I think the Ukrainian example stands out for Putin because it's an expensive disaster. I mean, the Donbass is a disaster. Nobody wants the Donbass, neither Russia nor Ukraine. Crimea has been, has been annexed, but it's very expensive to keep, very expensive to provide water and, and other goods to Crimea. And therefore, he doesn't want that same thing to happen in Belarus. Belarus and Ukraine are quite different, in my view, from, from Armenia, Moldova, Georgia, wherever. These are, as far as Putin's concerned, the Slavic heartland. He wants to keep them close. He doesn't want them. He doesn't want them in the EU, and he certainly doesn't want them anywhere near NATO. And this, for Putin, is his established red line. This is where he's going to, he would be prepared to do anything to defend that status quo, as far as those countries are concerned. So, I think Belarus is very sensitive for Putin, and um, he will go very carefully. But I don't think that change. Um, will never happen. I think it will happen. And I think it may happen much sooner than, than people anticipate. Thank you, David, for that answer. Uh, so I'm going to move away from my scripted questions because we have some questions from the audience. Um, there's that one in the chat, but there's an earlier one that actually picks up on something David said that I wanted to ask Valeri. Uh, and that question is, I'm going to just copy and paste it, but I'll, I'll just read it as well. Uh, what role does the creation of Belarusian speaking schools and the overall development of Belarusian culture and language uh, play in the uh, development of the democratic uh, movement in Belarus? I'll copy that as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I can see this. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, like we we have to be realistic and. Uh, um, we have to be honest uh, about the protest. It was uh, mostly Russian speaking. Uh, um, and uh, mostly Russian speakers uh, constituted the, the large mass of people who went out and protested and uh, showed all the best traits of our society and uh, our identity and kind of being in solidarity with each other, supportive, uh, being hopeful and, uh, uh, and willing to follow the, the lead of women uh, very often uh, in this protest. So. Uh, it is, uh, it's been mostly Russian speaking, uh, but at the same time, uh, people responded very positively to national symbols, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and uh, we have also witnessed a huge spike in the interest to, to the Belarusian national identity, to, to culture, to history, to language. And uh, it, was, uh, it was happening in a very organic form. It was not, again, it was not imposed. Uh, nobody was calling for that. People were just becoming more interested in these issues and sort of were seeking for some, uh, some answers to questions like who we are and what we want, uh, kind of why are we kind of here on these streets? Why are we together? Who we are? And what are these symbols? Like what they mean to us? Uh, so uh, I would say at this point of time, um, because of this severe crackdown on everything, uh, which has affected all aspects of, uh, of, of society's life, uh, the Belarusian uh, element of it uh, has also suffered significantly, kind of uh, on the institutional, structural level. Uh, and uh, I think that ev everything is uh, in a bit of retreat. Uh, right now, not not to kind of give up on these ideas, but to to preserve what we have, and uh, to to preserve people, to save people, uh, kind of to uh, to ensure that uh, people are not suffering more than they have already suffered. Uh, uh, at the same time, the the role of uh, Belarusian education, language education, uh, is hugely important, and uh, um, I would say being part of the democratic forces, uh, being part of the team of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya is that Belarusian language 
is very central to our own operation. We use uh, Belarusian language extensively, but at the same time, we also uh, hear the response from uh, from in, in social media, from society. Sometimes there is not sufficient; they want more. Uh, so uh, this this issue is evolving. Uh, it is uh, it is alive and well. Uh, people have a lot of interest to, uh, to Belarusian language and to Belarusian identity in general. Uh, so I think that um, there will be there will be a demand for more space and more role for Belarusian education and language uh, in, the, in the nearest future. Thank you, Larry. Uh, David, anything to add? Or uh, I also wanted to ask the other question from the chat. Um, yeah, I didn't. Um, how does it? The question. So I'll, I'll just read the. So it's in it's in the chat. I think it's to everybody. Uh, but the question is from the perspective of our speakers. I'll go with David first. Uh, how institutionalized uh, is the Belarusian regime beyond Lukashenko? In other words, does the regime exhibit a strong capacity to survive a secession crisis or succession crisis, not secession, uh, mm -hmm. and survive Lukashenko, similar to sort of post Chavez Venezuela? Uh, that survives despite some fairly deep sanctions. That question, thank you to uh, Dr. Ganesh Tesker. Uh, and if anybody else, please drop it in the chat line uh, and I'll, I'll ask the questions. My, my view is, is actually that it, it doesn't. I mean, I said earlier that the original constitution was a, was a credible constitution. But what I think has happened over, over the past quarter of a century is that the Belarusian state and the per person of President Lukashenko have been closely equated. It's more or less the same thing. So that Lukashenko today believes he is the Belarusian state and that, you know, when you attack, the, when you attack Lukashenko, you are attacking the state. And this is a sort of mentality um, that he, that he's, that's evolved so that you may have to start all over again. I mean, that this is just my personal opinion, but I think um, it would be very difficult now to establish some kind of post-Lukashenko state on a, on a democratic basis. I mean, he's already um, made the provision that if he steps down, um, he, he gives power to the Security Council, which is, again, another violation of the original constitution, whereby the you know, the chairman of the parliament would take over in the first instance until there are new presidential elections. So I, I think there have to be several steps. I think, first of all, um, and I would put them in this order, the release of the prisoners, then the elections, and then talk about a new constitution or how the state is going to be governed and, and treat it as more or less like 1991. You're back in 1991. Well, you know, what can come after the Soviet Union? You've got to sort of build up from the beginning and belarus had a what two and a half three years to do this but the whole thing um collapsed very quickly once lukashenko came to power and established this authoritarian regime which got more and more like a totalitarian regime as as the regime continued so no it's uh, things have to change i mean there has to be a massive massive um societal society run change where the government of belarus the parliament of belarus has to become an institution with some real credibility and power to make decisions the legislature ultimately has, has to act as a break on presidential power and i think you found you know in the neighboring states ukraine uh, and russia uh, I, I would say have kind of gone in different directions but i think somewhere like estonia where the parliament elects the president would be a more ideal solution for Belarus. I don't think you can continue with things up as they are now. Otherwise, you may well get what Venezuela's got, which is a, a post-Chavez regime, which is another disaster for Venezuela. And you know, I wouldn't like to see that happening in Belarus. Thank you, David. And so, Valeri, same, same question here. Uh, can the regime survive uh, following the removal of Lukashenko? Would, would it uh, operate under some other... Uh, for. Well, I would agree that in 27 years, uh, the some kind of political culture has been formed uh, inside the regime, and uh, 
Um, it might, uh, of course, we're seeking a perfect solution, an ideal solution when uh, the, the transition would be orderly uh, and uh, will come to, uh, to the elections that would be uh, conducted freely and fairly and under the observation of the international community. And, but at the same time, it might happen differently uh, when there could be a coup, uh, there could be a, a strong Russian uh, involvement uh, if something happens to Lukashenko, for example, or if the military would decide to do something kind of to, uh, to salvage what's, what's still there. Uh, there are still um, people around Lukashenko, even though they might be uh, despising uh, Lukashenko uh, himself, but they benefit from this system, and uh, they might want to maintain uh, the the institution of fear uh, among those, and the institution of uh, this um, sort of manual uh, management of the law and order uh, in in Belarus when uh, decisions are are made according not to to the constitution, to the law, but uh, kind of to the um, uh, to the ongoing uh, situation and uh, such considerations of the ongoing moment. Uh, so uh, I am, uh, while I am sort of optimistic uh, that we will do this uh, in the right way, I have also concerns that it might turn uh, in the way we, we see it in, uh, uh, in other countries. Uh, it might be it might be messy uh, and it might not be as ideal as we want it to be. Uh, maybe not as Venezuela and maybe not as intact as it is now with Lukashenko, uh, but um, there's also a chance that some elements will be preserved and uh, some of the elements that we hate. Thank you. Uh, Valeri, uh, getting a couple more questions. Uh, so, uh, Mikolai asks uh, a question I kind of want to expand on uh, and starting with Valeri. Uh, and so the question uh, is about the security forces and the security forces have obviously carried out some numerous sort of violations of uh, physical integrity rights and, and human rights. Um, but at the same time, they do keep the regime active. So how does the opposition, of, should the opposition approach a dialogue to sort of alleviate concerns that the security forces have that if they you know, give up Lukashenko that they're all going to be imprisoned or something like that? Um, so is this the question from the chat, uh, kind of, uh, against the crimes against, uh, about the crimes? Against I, the I sort of modified the question. A little. All right. All right. Uh, so, uh, I would respond probably to both because I like the question from Nikolai, uh, about the crimes again, against society. I think that, uh, the, um, the human rights abuses and the lawlessness, uh, that we witness now in Belarus is the result of actions of many, many, many people. Uh, it is not just a small clique around Lukashenko. Uh, it is not just law enforcement, but uh, it is uh, it is much broader. And uh, not uh, not always this. Uh, or rather, I would say like uh, more. Um, most of these people would do this uh, uh, reluctantly, under pressure, kind of being uh, intimidated, being coerced into this. Uh, but they were part of this. They, they, they remain part of this repression machine uh, against uh, the Belarusian people. Uh, so um, very reluctantly, but probably very reluctantly, but we would have to, uh, to, go, to go the course of reconciliation and uh, mending faces and fences uh, with, the, with the society and uh, kind of, uh, instead of uh, teaching lessons, uh, learning lessons, uh, instead of punishing uh, each other, uh, for what happened, uh, kind of trying to understand why it happened and creating mechanisms and institutions to, to prevent this from happening again. But uh, in order for, for Belarusian society to be functional and to be um, cohesive and, 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 and going further together, uh, we would have to step over some of the grievances and losses of, uh, of today. Thank you, Larry. And uh, David, do you have anything to add with respect to any of those questions? David, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, I don't have anything to add to Mikolai's question. I mean, I could answer the one from Marina if you want. Um, sure, go ahead. Which is on, on the Estonian model. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, completely, um, completely uh, a committed fan of the Estonian model or anything like that, but I, I do have a belief that the political 
systems that develop in a democratic manner do so through political parties and parliaments that at least have some some authority and i think in in belarus the formation of political parties has always been discouraged and even today um lukashenko he opposes any kind of political party even even one that supports him and even a presidential party like putin has for example you don't find that in belarus and the belarusian parliament today um doesn't have representatives from political parties since 2015 so i think that would be a good foundation to form a, a parliamentary system based on political parties where the president is elected through the parliament um it's not the only way but i think it would be a means to stop a president abusing his powers and you've got a kind of state you know like belarus like russia where the presidential power has just been renewed over and over uh, by whatever means necessary you know amending the constitution uh, putin can remain in power until what 2036 or something um, that may be too too long but anyway sometime in the uh, in the distant future and lukashenko has already announced that he, he he intends to stay in power and at least reach the next elections which will be 2025 so that's that's i think it would be an alternative if lukashenko goes um i think you would probably have to have a system that is different from the one now uh, for for it to be a stable society and not one that's turning into some kind of quasi dictatorship um and i think all, all all the other things like whether you have an amnesty for security forces and people who've committed crimes um are things that would be decided in, in in the future but i do think it's reasonable to say that quite often you know when the demonstrators used to take the masks off the security forces they usually ran away i mean they did not want to be identified they've got this um security of being masked when they're carrying out these these brutal actions but they're known to people right people know people they live in different in in apartment blocks with them and i still would also suggest that um even among the security forces there are people who are not necessarily pro regime they've just been hired to do a job and they paid well for it so a long answer to to that question but okay um do we have any other questions uh so arena has a question uh either one of you guys can pick up on that the new history of belarus <laughs> yeah I, i mean obviously we need a new history of belarus it's a long time since we had one in in uh, english um and i think save the truth for future generations you know um i i don't think there's a you know even despite the repression of the media and 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 also of higher educational institutions and limits placed on people it's still possible you know to find out about the belarusian past i don't think it's so difficult um one thing that has always irritated me as a researcher has been the closure closure of the KGB archives um which contains some of the deepest secrets of the belarusian past and i think that has been a a problem of the history of belarus that part of it has been concealed and part of it has been um i would say subject to laudation and and almost unquestionable um narrative the a narrative on the on the war years that you cannot question the years of stalinism for example have never been fully exposed in belarus even today um the history of the holocaust in belarus is only just starting now to receive attention from historians There are a lot of things in the history of belarus i think that need to be developed whether it could be done from belarus i don't know but i think right now there are many belarusian scholars operating in the west and i think probably we should have enough out here to do something like a new history of belarus All right uh blurry anything to add then i think we'll we'll wrap up after this no nothing else to add to what they said he's the best person to speak about all right great 
Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Valeri, for joining us. Thank you, audience, for joining us uh, in this discussion. Hopefully, uh, we cleared some things up, uh, moved discussion forward, uh, and uh, I welcome you, know, you guys uh, to uh, reach out for further questions. This, this talk will be uh, available, uh, I think, it, it recorded somewhere. So if you have somebody else uh, that you want to share this with, um, uh, please. Moderator, do you have a web? Is it going to be on that website that uh, it, the link of it is currently on? Because I can like just link that website to everyone. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, so the SBSIA YouTube channel will be where it is uh, available. Uh, I will just very quickly get that to you guys in the chat. So again, if you want to share with everybody, political science, GCF. Uh, but yes, uh, virtual applause to our two panelists, Dr. Mar David Marples, Dr. Kolowski, uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, everybody uh, for turning out. Uh, take our coffee.